This is a 55-year-old man who developed chest pain while playing tennis with his son. He went to see his primary care physician the next day, who did an EKG and blood tests, including a troponin. All of these were unremarkable, and the primary care physician referred him for an exercise test. This was markedly abnormal, and for that reason, the patient was referred for a coronary angiogram. Many of the patients we see today in the cath lab have multivessel disease. With drug-eluting stents, we've become more aggressive and often treat these patients with multivessel stenting. However, in some cases, bypass may be more appropriate. Therefore, one of our first decisions is determining whether or not a patient would be best treated with bypass or with multivessel stenting. This is a challenging case. As you can see from the angiogram, we have at least a moderate and possibly significant left main lesion. The mid-LAD lesion does look significant. The ramus intermedius branch has at least moderate disease, which may be significant. The circumflex has some disease as well, but it's a small vessel. The right coronary has mild to moderate disease that doesn't look too bad in this case. Now, the concept of FFR and the procedure itself may seem intimidating to you and to your cath lab staff, but I think you'll find that after you've done a few cases that in a matter of minutes, you can measure the FFR down a vessel and find out exactly which lesions need stenting and which do not. In our cath lab, we always have the analyzer connected and turned on and ready for use. If we decide to measure FFR, this way we avoid any potential delays. We can just connect the wire and we're ready to begin. If the analyzer isn't connected and you decide to measure FFR, the first step is to connect it and to calibrate and zero the aortic pressure as well as the pressure wire itself. The pressure wire is a 0.014 inch regular angioplasty guide wire, which has a sensor that sits three centimeters from the tip of the wire. Once you've completed these steps, you're ready to advance the pressure wire into the guiding catheter. The next step is to position the wire so that its sensor is sitting just at the ostium of the guiding catheter. In this position, the two should be measuring equal pressures. If they're not, you can equalize the pressure wire to the guiding catheter's pressure. In this way, you'll be able to accurately measure FFR. In this case, the team was most concerned about the LAD in the left main. For that reason, the pressure wire was placed in the distal LAD. The resting gradient that is present is not the FFR. In order to measure FFR, it is critical to first induce maximal hyperemia. Intravenous adenosine was infused to maximize flow down the LAD. This gives a long-lasting effect, which allows very accurate determination of the FFR. With the pressure wire in the distal LAD and during maximal hyperemia, the FFR is measured and found to be 0.70. This tells us that the anterior wall is getting 70% of the blood flow that it should be getting. However, it does not tell us which part of the LAD is contributing to the ischemia. We can slowly pull the pressure wire back and find that the bulk of the gradient occurs at the mid-LAD lesion. When the pressure sensor is just distal to the left main lesion, there's very little gradient, suggesting that the left main is not contributing to the ischemia. This allowed the team to use a percutaneous approach and stent the mid-LAD lesion. After stenting the mid-LAD, FFR was measured again. This was to make sure that the stents were well deployed and to confirm that the left main was not significant. The FFR was 0.94, which is basically normal and a very satisfying result. Next, the team turned their attention to the ramus lesion. To my surprise, the FFR was 0.95. This tells us that that lesion does not need stenting. It also reconfirms that the left main is not significant. The circumflex was felt to be too small for stenting, and so FFR wasn't measured there. The right coronary artery had an innocent, mild-appearing lesion. The team thought to be absolutely sure that there's no residual ischemia, they would measure FFR there as well. Surprisingly, the FFR was 0.69. 
This just goes to show that you cannot rely on angiography alone when trying to determine the significance of intermediate coronary lesions. In summary, this case is instructive for a number of reasons. If the team had relied on angiography alone to treat the patient, they would have perhaps unnecessarily sent the patient to bypass surgery if they assumed that the left main was significant. Alternatively, they could have assumed that the left main was not significant and treated the LAD as well as unnecessarily treating the ramus. In addition, they would have left the right coronary untreated and the patient would have likely returned with symptoms and needed a repeat procedure. Using fractional flow reserve, particularly in patients with multivessel disease, makes a lot of sense. It allows you to avoid guesswork and know which lesions need stenting and which ones do not. All in all, this procedure was a great success. The team did a nice job using FFR to treat this patient. And because of this, I'm sure the patient will have an excellent long-term outcome. That was out. What? No, that was in. That was definitely in. I saw it. <laughs> okay, possibly. Good game. Good game. <laughs>